So this installment of the How to Get a Publication module is about the scholarly mindset. This is the how you come up with ideas. It's what I call the thing that you can develop that helps you find and recognize opportunities to make science. And there are plenty of people out there who get 50 publications per year. And if you know some of those people, you probably recognize it's not because they're the expert in all things. It's because they see opportunities and they're willing to put the work in. The learning objective from the video is to come away able to describe some strategies you can use to choose a topic for publication or from writing for publication. So appealing to your scholarly mind, the mindset is more than keeping an eye out for good cases like to put on a poster. That perfect case report with the rare diagnosis that we actually confirm and successfully treat while you're on the wards happens never. And if it does happen, a hundred people are clamoring for that to make a poster out of it. There are many more ways to get a publication or even a case report than just finding some case presentation of a rare disease. And I use case reports or even posters as an example a lot in this talk because it's a great way to break in. When I say publication, I'm talking about not poster, but a peer-reviewed publication. I want you to see that there are opportunities for case reports all around you. It doesn't have to be a zebra to get published. It's largely how you present the case, how you frame your case, and where you submit it that gets it published. And I want you to know there are hundreds of journals indexed in PubMed, real journals, that will publish case reports, and even that only publish case reports, which comes as a, as a surprise to a lot of people. But let's say you don't have any good cases. So how do you come up with ideas? And in my opinion, it's way easier to publish a case report in a journal than it is, for example, to win a poster competition at a conference. Keeping an eye out for cases that could be published in a journal is different. And when we're talking about case reports for publication, you're picking the periodical, you're picking the audience and the angle to make it interesting for that journal to publish it. If you can squeeze in some basic science concepts, it's gold. A couple of examples that come to mind, just like in the past year, that nobody wrote up at my institution. So, um, a 20-year-old with an ischemic stroke. Kind of rare? Does it happen? Sure. Is that a winning poster at, a, at an internal medicine conference? Probably not. But is it a good case report for a neurology journal, which um, has case report for images? It's highly publishable in that context. Or um, a, a, an 18 year old patient is admitted, brings drugs into the hospital, and they overdosed while they were admitted for something else. Is that an interesting poster for a conference? I don't know, maybe, but it's a, a highly publishable case report in an addiction medicine journal, in an adolescent medicine journal, definitely. So, what do you know? that you have a publishable case for a case report. Just think about whether your patients are out of the ordinary or interesting in some way, in some context. If you've told three other people about a patient that day, because there's a, a story that goes with it, it's, it, it's interesting, it's remarkable in some way, you're gonna look it up, you Google it, you read about it, um, you're gonna figure out what's already written about it. Anything you've dedicated extra mind power to will also be interesting to someone else and you see little things all the time even in clinic my first publication was a clinic case report it would absolutely not have been good enough for a poster but i used it as a vehicle to illustrate a concept and got it into a no-name journal did i change the world with it no but i got my publication i learned about the publication process it doesn't have to be a groundbreaking case it doesn't have to be new or rare if it is those things, great. Otherwise, it just has to be interesting, well-written, illustrate some concept, have some message. There are enough journals out there that you can get it done. And more about recognizing opportunities. If you've submitted in an abstract to a conference, I think you've done enough work to justify doing maybe a little more work to make it a paper for publication. There's a lot of studies looking at what percentage of abstracts presented at a conference, for example, goes on to get published in a journal. To make the point that we're missing opportunities to publish. This was from an article that came out in 2017. 
out of that number of abstracts presented at a conference in 2009, just less than half, this is a national conference, less than half were later published as their full article in a case report journal or a peer review journal of some kind. And you can interpret that in one of two ways. One, half of conference abstracts aren't worthy of publication. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, depending on the conference. But I think abstracts that have made it to a national conference are probably good enough to get in a journal. I've published several things that are not interesting enough for a national conference. Or two, half of people aren't following through and getting their stuff published. And I think the truth is probably somewhere in between, which begs the question, for all the abstracts that we generate at a typical residency program or at your facility, are you getting half of them published? Statistically, you could be. I said there were a lot of studies looking at that, and so this is a Cochrane review of 425 of those studies, looking at what proportion of meeting abstracts are later published in full, like in a journal article. Again, that's less than half, just less than half though, across all specialties and across basically all decades consistently. And they've looked at factors associated with getting published, and it's kind of the things you think of, a large sample size of a study or some kind of trial results and one possible interpretation of that is that people who have invested the time into a study with a lot of patients in it or in a trial format are more likely to put the extra effort into getting that published and i'll say the sooner the better people aren't holding on to their projects for 10 years and getting them published although there are a few if you're working on something put it in a folder and save it and come back to it the next part of that mindset is coming up it is is to question your dogma so what evidence supports the thing that you're doing that you always do that way question expert opinions question your own patterns of practice and be open-minded if you read a guideline and there's an expert opinion recommending something you can question that and, and find out why that recommendation is weak what's the available evidence behind it you know you can prove and disprove it with your own literature search or do your own study in my two personal favorite or, or proudest projects that I published started with me asking why am I doing what am I doing what I'm doing right now with this patient why am I checking this lab what evidence supports me doing that uh, what evidence supports what I'm about to do with the results of this lab if you want to make evidence you have to ask you have to ask yourself about the evidence that's out there And this is very important to start writing for the purpose of publication and have an idea of, of what's publishable about a specific topic. You have to know what's in the literature already in, in the format and in content. And you can't know all literature, obviously, but you can definitely know all the literature about a thing. And once you dig into pretty much anything, you'll see that our practice is governed by not that much strong evidence on any given topic. But you know, you dig into literature on what is already known, what's not known, what are people talking about in review articles, what are the gaps in knowledge, that's what makes you an expert. I need you to believe that it is relatively easy to become an expert in a little thing, whatever that thing your patient had was. Everyone here, you know, watching the video probably has done a literature search for a clinical question and, and thought there's nothing useful here. All I got is three case reports and maybe one review that's half related to this and maybe an expert opinion in some obscure guideline based on nothing. You know, how many times have you done that and just moved on? But guess what? You read that, those three things, and now you're an expert. And the less there is, the easier it is to become an expert for that purpose. Just take it to final step. Pull those articles. Look at the articles they cite. They all cite the same few articles. Pull those and read them. And maybe you have to go back and review a little physiology or something to put it together. You've now done a few hours of work on something. You're a complete expert. You have all the sources for whatever paper you're going to write. And even if you're not the world's expert, you're an expert at that moment from your perspective based on available evidence. And if it's a case, you can see how your case fits into those cases and then know what's interesting about your case. But it doesn't have to be some rare diagnosis. You just need your angle or your context. You use that knowledge of the literature to understand what's publishable about it. And I keep saying cases because that's an easy way to break in. But I could say, you know, if you had a clinical question and there's no answer in the literature that you dug up, you make the answer doing your study. It's an opportunity to write a review, for example. 
or do a retrospective. But knowing what's written tells you what's publishable and what questions still need answered. Times that you have become an expert and could have taken it to the next level, your resident lectures, your morning reports, your posters, your grand rounds, your M&Ms, you did reading, you are an expert. So when you've found your literature, when you've read those studies, the reviews, up to date, whatever else, read critically. And I think most people will know what I mean by that. When you read, think about what are the strengths and weaknesses of what I'm reading? What's missing? What is not known in there? You know, be skeptical about it. Is this generalizable? You know, when and where was this study done? Look at their source for the literature. Find it and save it. Learn who the experts are. Recognize that author appears on every single paper about that. That's an expert. And look at the citations in your source material and look at their citations. You know, a lot of the times it's a wild goose chase, but it gives you the rawest appreciation in your topic. You'll see that it goes in circles. It's the same three articles again and again. If you know those three, you know the whole thing. Once you understand what's written and what's known, then you know what the questions are and you can build your project on that. That finding and dissecting of literature is a skill you can definitely get better at doing quickly in a high yield way. Um, if there's only a bunch of case reports out there, that's ripe for a review article for you. You can do a systematic review or use your case report as a vehicle for reviewing that topic. If there are a bunch of reviews, read them for what's lacking and then that's your topic. On and on. The next really important aspect of this mindset is about considering your audience before you write. What's your angle? When you look at a patient for their potential as a case report, it's maybe not that it would win a research competition like I said or that it's a super cool thing, but just that it's interesting in some context. Example, I had a resident with a 90 year old patient with a GI bleed. And GI bleeds are not very interesting, but he wrote that up as a case report and got it published in a geriatrics journal because that was the angle. He picked his audience and got it published. So part of considering your audience is picking the journal you want to submit to. Obviously you need to one, pick one that publishes that type of article and sometimes look at their format. You know, maybe they only do case reports of this length. Um, and maybe I want to write a case series, which can be harder to write because it's more words, there's more details, and I still have to fit it into the same word limit sometimes. You need to find a journal that will publish your project in a way that gets your message across and, and still fits their criteria for word limits and everything. Okay, so I definitely need your attention for this one. If you zoned out, Please come back to me for this one thing. If you take away one thing from this talk, it is that you're unlikely to get a publication without writing something. You have to write. And I call this module Tips for the Amateur Scholar because most of us don't get paid to write, which means we're not going to be given a ton of time at work or on our rotations to do this, which means you have to use some of your free time to write. Talking about it will not get it done. I'm giving you permission now to not try and give all your ideas to someone or um, to get someone else to work with you. That's for a different level of scholar. If you come up with a project, idea, no matter what, if you're a med student, intern, faculty, and you have a vision, you do the project. If you have an idea, you need to say, I'm writing this and then you're the author, you're the first author, and you can invite people to help you or edit or, or assist you with things if you want, but nobody wants to spend their free time on your idea, so you do it. Lots of people will want to help you, I guarantee, once you've done the work. Lastly, there are ways that opportunities present themselves. Um, one, it just falls right into your lap. Either a colleague asks you to look at their paper because they think you're an expert or someone needs a textbook chapter that's due and, and they don't have time, they want you to do it, or someone who's very motivated to be a mentor adopts you and drags you along through the process. And if you don't know, those scenarios almost never happen. They're very rare and they're luck. 
So if you encounter such an opportunity, you have to say yes to that and do a good job and do it in a timely manner and, and, and carry out your commitment you've made on that. That is a very high yield situation. You're not going to get those opportunities again unless you say yes and you're reliable. If you've ever said, I had too much to do this month to write that book chapter, that you did it wrong. And people that have a million third and fourth author publications, it's not luck at that point. It's because they've been identified as productive and they've developed a network by doing so. And that's not the same as your friend saying, hey, we should write this up. That's not real until someone does the work. I'm talking about concrete offers here. I have numerous examples of calling up very productive people um, who don't need another case report and, and, and asking for their help or asking if they want to be involved and nobody says no. And so that's my vision of the scholarly mindset, which and I want that for you. Um, our objective from the beginning of this talk was to describe strategies that people use and that you can use to write uh, on a scholarly topic or to try and get a publication. I hope now that you're on your way to doing that. Thank you.